All right, Foot Clan, we got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about a little bit of news, and then we're breaking down six surprising stats on today's episode, looking to the future, getting into the mailbag, and a whole lot more. Make sure you click subscribe. Stay with us all off-season long and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Tuesday episode of the show. Jason Moore is here. Yellow. Mike, the fantasy hitman, present, accounted for. Uh, a blue. No. No? No. no. I was hoping you weren't going to do that. Why? I'm Andy Holloway. Why? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like fun. Is that fun? Was that fun? Yeah. I had a Just good time. Just any, any joke? That's what that's my kid's policy. Any, any joke? joke is a good joke? Any joke's a good joke. As long as you're not being serious. There are a handful of jokes that are... They are not good jokes. I mean, I just can't stand when they're said. And we're pretty close on that last one because it's like. It's a color, did, it's a color joke. Did you, did you yeah. get your hair cut? If you say, oh, I've got lots of them cut, I'm going to slap you. Yeah, see, I'm that's, gonna that's where it was. I'm going to slap you in the face. Really? Yeah, because you're, you're. That is an ultimate dad joke. That is a dad's dad joke. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a, a grandpa that's joke. A g joke. That is, it's unacceptable to me. Those are, you know, oh. Okay. Did the deucers like the color joke that Mike made? Were you down with that? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Oh, Look, boy, that's a man who's not sure which oh, wow. boss it's, to please. <laughs> it's it's not a joke that's going to get deep belly laughter. Probably shouldn't be discussed, really. It's just more of a... Yeah. yeah if, no, if I I mean, say, say hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Oh, God, oh my gosh. <laughs> just just <laughs> get rid of my life. Those th Welcome There's a in. handful of those jokes that just they irritate me like crazy. Okay, I'm making a note. Yeah. <laughs> Making, Wait to say them more or say them less. No, making a note to point out Jason's jokes to himself. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you. Oh no. They're gonna be good. <laughs> no. And you will have to look in the mirror and you'll have a reckoning of are they funny or do you tell bad jokes? We'll find out. Well, we have, we got an episode <laughs> for you today. We're diving into I think we have six shocking stats from twenty twenty three. They're electric. They uh they're very interesting, and they all have follow-up questions that we'll discuss on the show today. As we look forward to 2024, it is a great time to head over to ultimatedraftkit.com because if you pick up the UDK before March 1st, you are entered to win a listener league spot, a chance to come and play with the three of us in the listener league. You get the lowest possible price. If you get the UDK+, plus, you get a chance to jump right into the Dynasty Pass uh, there are three releases of the Dynasty Pass, the pre-combine, post-combine, and post-NFL draft releases with rankings. Uh, we've got all the college production profiles in there, rookie mock drafts, team opportunity pages, trade targets, a lot of good Dynasty content. And the UDK Plus also unlocks the Draft Analyzer when we release that this summer. And the Ultimate DFS Pass, you'll get access to that throughout the 2024 season. All of that's available at ultimatedraftkit.com right now, so please check that out. And uh, let's jump into the quick question of the day. What is one uncommon rule you think should be added to every league and how? Well, that's very strong, though. The, e the every league part? Yeah. I to I, some leagues, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, my, my, I like my answer for just it's it's a fun thing, but I'm not mandating this. Well, the, the second part of the question was how do you know where to draw the line of trying to implement new rules, which... I also relate to that question because there are people in our league that just they're just always coming up with some new new craziness. I, I think the you just don't need to add things to add things. If you find something that makes your league better, then vote and consider it. And and a lot of times what we've done in our league is we've done kind of what the NFL does, which is, hey, we're going to implement this this season. It's not like a forever rule change, and then if we like it, we'll cement it and make it a forever rule change or not. Um, since I'm talking, I'll, I'll answer mine. This has shifted for me, Mike, to I want it in every league. 
Yeah, I'm good. Every with that one. single league I play in, now that I've played in this format enough, I prefer playing against the league median as well as the head to head matchup. I wasn't sure <clears throat> prior to really experiencing it if I would because I, I there's something fun about anyone beating anyone on any given week. You know, the the worst team can surprise the you know the the number one seed. And so I thought maybe, and what playing against league median is, what that means is basically every single week you get, you, you're playing two wins and losses. You, you're playing against your opponent, and then also you get a win or a loss if you're in the top half of scorers that week or if you're in the bottom half of scorers that week. So you can go 2-0 and on a week, 1-1 and on a week, or 0-2. And, and I thought it might take a little bit of that randomness away in a negative way, but I'm telling you, I never, ever, ever cared more about the rest of my league and how they were doing and how their That's matchups were going. Yep. And I like I paid more attention in those leagues where it was like, okay, I'm not just looking at my matchup. I'm saying, okay, I'm, uh, I really want my guys to do well and I want his guys to do bad, but I'm looking at the whole league. Oh, am I going to cross that threshold? Am I going to be in the top half? I need to score more points or whatever. It, but it was the just problem more is, fun is you, for me. You probably couldn't find out till the next day because well, of how uh, added complexity and where you knew teams would end up. Well, I mean, you're not going to find out until the last snap of the the week, but that's probably the same for your matchup as well. You so can, it didn't. It wasn't like project. a. It wasn't like a bit of a. You know. Uh, I guess it, it's not quite in that tier, but the whole argument, like the participation trophy situation, right? Not where, at all. Where like. You lose some of the extremes of emotion, win or loss, because you've got this consolation prize of of the median. One hundred percent. That that was that was my worry. Things like that. I really genuinely did not. I thought it would make it less fun, more fair, but less fun. There you and, go. And it made it <laughs> it made it more fair and more fun, which is why I think every league should have. It. I like the point Jay of pointing out that. Yeah, you're, you, your rooting interest going into Monday night is no longer just that person's matchup. Like there could be a bunch of things that could change, and the the kind of the overarching to me, the reason you go with that is, I, I guess, to eliminate. You were worried to eliminate fun, but it's eliminate the really bad beats of you're the second highest scorer in the league. You just play happen to play against the first. Meanwhile, some. Uh, some turd over here wins a weekend with 68 points. Meanwhile, you have 150, and it's just like that, some turd. That feels oh, that's a turd. That that's got to be Josh. It feels so <laughs> so bad, and and it does happen a lot. So in in the leagues that I've played with the league median, it doesn't seismically change everything, but it it does prevent a little bit of the the weird where like the team scored the seventh most points and they sneak in with the sixth seed. Because they just happen to They're, get that schedule this year. You guys are somewhat persuasive here. I feel like I'm uh, on this one in particular. I'm stuck in the maybe too much of an uh, uh, old ways mindset. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, you know, it does it does really really suck to be the second highest scorer and and not yes. get any credit for the week. It also, you know, I haven't done it. We haven't done it in our main leagues. Right. However, I could see it making the weekend more exciting in the respect that sometimes you, you face an opponent and it is an unmitigated blowout early and the weekend's over. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are fighting for a median score, you are rooting. Like, let's say you already know you're going to lose your matchup. At least you're rooting for something the rest of the weekend. Yeah. No, it, so it, I, I, I'm, it hmm. act, yeah, I'm telling you, it Maybe. Is, if you haven't played in this, look to add it in your leagues. I will be bringing it up to vote in our league of record. Probably the next four years until I convince <laughs> everyone to do it. And Ooh, then, the odds of that going through are low, huh? No, uh, I don't know. No, about we, third, third, years like, the third times to try. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like we got three yes votes potentially here, but uh, I, I, it really is fun. Um, so I highly recommend it. That's, yeah, some turd already said decline. Yeah, he's already he's already. Voting yeah, no, it, it makes it makes sense. Makes sense for him to not want that because it makes it more fair and takes away his illegitimate wins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's uh, the, to me. That's the that's the rule that I think does actually improve things. Just so yours I mean, is a, your other idea first, is more like fun. It's first downs, and that it's been gaining more and more in popularity. And the argument for it is simply, you're well, like half it, a point or what? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't. For a I, first don't I don't know what it needs to be a half, a full point, because you don't. It just like a a PPR where you get a whole point just for catching the ball. That to us over time felt like that's too overpowered. Where if a receiver is catching a, a pass for two yards, they should not be getting more points than a, a, an RB who just carried the ball nine yards. You know what I mean? So you have to find the balance. But that trying to at so least – just to be clear, you're talking about rewarding players when they gain a first down. Yeah, so it's third and one. Running back carries the ball. They only get two yards. But those in the NFL – that's humongous. So you just want and, to make Jalen Hurts even more powerful. And they're more <laughs> that, difficult that could be a problem. to get. Not every two yards is as easy and difficult yeah. to get when the when the defense is stacked up against the run because they've got to stop you for one yard. That's a tough yard to get. So the point being, fantasy football is not real-life NFL football. But if you can find some places where it starts to match a little bit more, I'm not opposed to it. According to Mr. Borgannoni, Himself, he said it double rewards touchdowns because touchdowns count as first downs in the yeah, NFL. Yeah, that they shouldn't in this type of a scoring format. Yeah, you'd have to make that adjustment. Well, I don't know it, if you can. It, you can very easily. You make oh. touchdowns worth five points. Yeah, that would fix it. You solved the it <laughs> problem, is Jason. Done. The problem was was put in front of you, and yeah. I mean a mere moment. Yeah, you solved it. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I already knew that solution. So. Why, he was he was figuring that out while you were thinking more color jokes. <laughs> yeah. Well, well done. Uh, all right. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. All right. We are into the offseason mode. A lot of chatter right now around the NFL, around players, and whether they'll be on the same rosters in coming weeks. Today is the first day teams can designate franchise and transition tags. The fran franchise tag deadline is March 5th. Wow. Free agency less than a month away. So you already have teams talking about, you know, like Kirk Cousins situation is an interesting one to watch, right? Unrestricted free agent. Yeah, I mean, I can't be franchise tagged. I think half the league should be going after him. He's talked about giving the Vikings a discount. But, I mean, if 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 I'm another GM and I'm a quarterback away, there's not quarterbacks out there to get. So you got to – he'll get a bunch of money offered to him. See, the only reason I could be surprised the other direction is because we sat here last offseason expecting an actual battle for Lamar Jackson and the league ignored him. Well, Which it, is, it, like if the league knew last year that Jackson was going to come back and the league knows this year that – he just prefers to be with the Vikings. Maybe but you won't get competition. It wasn't really. This is a different battle because the, the Lamar Jackson was he was, uh, what I believe non exclusive franchise tag. Would right. you say that there was a mistake made by the rest of the league? Oh yeah, I mean yeah. we said it Would, then. We, yeah. we said we said it was a mistake by the. I guess not because the Ravens won. But I was like, this is a mistake by the Ravens. How am how am I another team? And all I got to do is give up two first round picks if I don't have a quarterback. I'm probably willing to spend one first-round pick on a QB. Then it's just one bonus one to get Lamar Jackson, and I give him the new contract. But in addition to that, you you are doing – a lot of the teams said they didn't want to do the work for the Ravens because the Ravens could then just say, okay, I'm going to sign that deal. Which – that's so lazy. <laughs> like, that's unbelievable. Well, here's the thing. We could maybe get, you know, a franchise-changing uh, quarterback here, but – Red I, tape. I got I, I got tea time tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. I I've, I got to be out of the office by three p.m. today. I can't possibly make it happen. That's why they need AI to uh, <laughs> I mean, to write. How these many up. people are doing the work here? Do they have just they have like I, one I, part timer? We we kind of said it. We I think everybody just knew it was going to happen. Jimmy G suspended for the first two games of twenty twenty four for violating the performance enhancing substance policy. Okay, the Raiders are expected to release him already. And I well, saw the Raiders projected in a mock draft this morning to take J.J. McCarthy okay. in the draft, but they are definitely a team it primed to get a quarterback. I mean, the the gift that the Raiders were given, because I believe, Kyle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they can now essentially – his guaranteed money is gone because of this suspension where, I mean, 
sure they probably were going to cut him, but they were going to have this huge money hit. And now because of this weird suspension, they get to say, well, we're not paying you the money, and we get to get and, out of this. And I'm going to be honest, they didn't work that well. Yeah. Whatever he was on. <laughs> well, I don't know what – I imagine this is recovery from his injury, but I we don't know. We don't have the information. Uh, the Seahawks informed Geno Smith he'll remain on the roster for 2024. For now. Yeah, I was going to say that that's not exactly how I had read, read it, but the uh, the contract is fully guaranteed. They could trade him. Yeah. the, so the he's, he's guaranteed contract now. There was a period of time where it was like it, it, we knew that his money was going to go to him, and they needed – if they were going to for sure move on, they would have done it by Friday. Tank Dell expected to be ready for OTAs. I think we're all excited for that. So, um, typical recovery timeline for his injury was four to six months. I have officially between the Tank Dell and Nico Collins. Uh -huh. Oh, I, I have oh, is this a declaration here? I have officially switched twelve times. Oh, twelve oh, times. Right. Yeah, where, right, where right now, we? I'm Nico. Right now, okay. I'm Nico. Buck All right. Tank. Now I'm, you were Tank last week. I, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying, man. <laughs> I like both, and I don't know who I like more. I bet you like the one that's drafted at a lower cost. By the time draft day comes around, I have seen. What if they're back to? Back? I was going to say I've seen them very close in uh, in some ADPs. Nelson Aguilar one year deal to come back to the Ravens. They were so happy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, that is it for news and notes. Uh, we'll take a quick break and come back with some shocking stats from last year. Just checking in real quick, Jason. Is it still Nico? No, it's Tank. It's Tank, Tank Dell, Dell. now. You've, yeah. you've made the switch? Yep. Wow. I'm it's telling you. It's very a, short term. Yeah. He needs uh, one of those uh, reversible jerseys that's just like <laughs> one's Nico and one's Tank. All right, let's jump in. How'd you do that? Hi. It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. All right, we're looking at the... 2023 season at some fascinating, interesting uh, stats that we dug up, that the research team here dug up. Dug up? Dug dug up. up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doing real good. Yep. Lamar Jackson was the MVP of the National Football League. It was a far cry production-wise from his first camp MVP campaign in 2019. That year, he had run for 1,200 on the ground, seven touchdowns on the ground, Threw for 36 touchdowns through the air. This year, it was 3,600 passing yards. I remember there was quite a bit of offseason debate on that number. We were talking about whether we thought he could get to 4,000 with Todd Monken. Didn't happen. 3,600, nope. 24 touchdowns, 821 on the ground, five touchdowns on the ground. But the numbers that are very interesting is that Lamar Jackson was almost perfect when targeting any Ravens receiver in the slot. And it's kind of wild, the passer rating in 2023. And this includes Mark Andrews, Zay Flowers, Nelson Aguilar, Isaiah Likely, Odell Beckham, Rashad Bateman. His passer rating to those players, 137, 130, 133, 154. That was Isaiah Likely, by the way. Uh, 100, Beckham was the lowest. And then Rashad Bateman, 140. So, um, you know, he, he had a dominant season targeting those players in the slot. Very interesting. It is interesting. Um, they they weren't very good on the outside, and I I wonder if that how much do you think is an indictment of the players that were on the outside? You know, the the Odell Beckham, Rashad Bateman, they had, they're on this list, but they had very few targets from so the slot because they're playing on we, the outside. I was going to bring it up. Of it's it, it may have something to do with just Lamar's comfort for learning this new system because it's a new system learning it and he was more comfortable in between the numbers where there's like there's tape of go watch Rashad Bateman because that's a huge question of what happened like how was this first round wide receiver who had a couple good games last year then a, then lost the season to injury how did he just vanish and there's plenty of routes of seeing him beat his defender into a like a real easy catch but for, but Lamar's just not looking at it. There was a, a disconnect. I was hoping you'd bring that up yep. because the, he, there were a lot of missed throws down the sideline. There were only 11 of his touchdowns to non-slot situations. So um, that was the 26th ranked uh, in, in the league. 
one fewer than the Cardinals. So there there wasn't I mean, I'm sure it's a little chicken and egg, but at the same time, like he went with his comfort level. And he's also a player that, you know, pulls the ball down and runs it. And so, you know, will teams adjust to this next year? I think that's going to be a big question mark heading into the year. If you have if you drafted Lamar Jackson after his first MVP season, you had some years of struggle. And so it's always going to be one of those dart throw situations. Um, but he was dominant throwing it to, you know, Andrews and Likely and Flowers in particular. Yeah, I, I think that's where he thrives a little bit more. But I don't see this as prescriptive for the future of, you know, th this was an outlier of just being literally perfect passer rating whenever targeting the slot. I can't imagine that that's sticky. They struggled when their defense couldn't give them a lead. Like, they were not a play-from-behind type of offense, mm. which also fits in with, you know, right. you fa the reason they weren't good from behind is they couldn't th throw the ball downfield. Their drives had to take a long time to get there. They really need an outside threat. Like, if Mike Evans came here, uh, I don't know if they've got the money to afford it, but they, it would be awesome. I mean, part of it is personnel, right? If you've got your two best receivers are definitely – Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers. Well, and those two guys are living in the slot. So right. it makes sense that that's where he's more effective. If you can bring in a good outside wide receiver, that would that would be something special to see. All right, let's turn the page here. NFL draft gold, we'll call it. For the ninth consecutive year, a team drafting in the top eight of the NFL draft also won their division. This year it was the Houston Texans. They went from 3-13-1 and and to 10-7. and seven. And eight of those nine teams that have done that. This is the real stat to me. Eight of those nine teams were in the top five of the draft. So you've had eight times in nine years where if you picked in the top five, one of those teams ended up winning their division, which is crazy. That is crazy. This last year you say, okay, well, it was because you got C.J. Stroud. I mean, that that was the, the massive difference maker. But you look back at, at some of the others, and it wasn't always the draft pick, the first round hit. You know, uh, Trayvon Walker last year for the Jaguars did it. He, he was okay, but he wasn't a sensational rookie. Uh, but that was also the – that's going from uh, – uh, what's his face? Urban Meyer, right? Yeah. So the, you know, the terrible Urban Meyer into – Well, I think you had a, a head competent. coaching change for most of these. Yeah, when you're picking in the top five. I mean, five, Houston did last year too. So it's <laughs> – sure. it, but to to jump up that many wins, they jump up on average six point seven wins. That's crazy. It, just to put that into perspective, if if that trend continues, here are the top eight teams in this draft: Carolina, Washington, New England, Arizona, the Chargers, the Giants, Tennessee, and Atlanta. So if you're picking one from the top five or the top eight there to win their division, the two teams that stand out to me, if you're going top five, it would be the Chargers. And if you go top eight, I'd go Atlanta. Yeah, that Atlanta seems to be the most likely one because that I mean they were seven and ten, pretty much contending to the, for the division till the last couple couple games. Yeah, I I think if we're going top eight, I would pick Tennessee uh, simply because that you know, they've they've got a beatable division. And um, if we're going top five, I, I I I would pick the Chargers, but again they've they've got Patrick Mahomes to worry about. I would actually go with the Cardinals. The Cardinals. I think you're right. They they didn't they tore it down last year. If you you know the they had they got rid of all their talent. They've got a ton of cap space now. They've got Kyler Murray back for a full season. Obviously, you got the Niners there, so that's that's um, difficult. But we've seen that the Super Bowl losing team very rarely uh, has a wonderful follow up season. All right. Uh the Washington Commanders became the first NFL team since 2015 to lead the NFL in pass attempts. <laughs> yeah. And yet did yes. not contribute a top 20 running back, a top 24 wide receiver, or a top 12 tight end in fantasy football. There was excitement about Eric the Enemy, Dotson. You know, you had McLaurin. a good start for Brian Robinson. Yeah. Everyone's always excited about Terry McLaurin. That's the default state of the offseason. Just never continues into the season. So 
not an impressive stat for Washington fans. Pretty hard to do. You know, when Washington does that, and then you get top 15 wide receivers, two of them, from Houston with a rookie quarterback. Talk about a surprise from fantasy perspective. If the commanders do draft a quarterback at two, which seems likely. It does. Will any of these Washington options end up worth the investment in fantasy? Oh, man. What's their which average would be draft the, position? The story would be bounce back Dotson, right? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, McLaurin has a quarterback. Right. Oh, number seven, seventh quarterback, or however many he's had. The first time he's had a good one, though. That'll be the narrative. The enemy's gone as well. So, no. <laughs> That's my answer. Your answer is that the that the offensive pieces there with a the rookie quarterback oh, are not going to do. We've got him, Jason. We've got your best ball ADPs. Oh, all right, all right. Do you want to try? Do you want to guess, or you just want me to give them to you? Just kidding. Terry McLaurin, wide receiver, thirty-five. Oh, baby. I'll definitely draft that's, him there. That's interesting. I mean, he was the wide receiver 28 this past season with He could finish Sam as high Hill. as 27. Uh, I think that, he was hey, wide receiver 14 That's, the year that's a return. Brian Robinson Jr., running back 28. That's that's not bad either. That's not bad. Uh, Dotson is the wide receiver. And Curtis – don't forget about Curtis Samuel, or I guess maybe we can now that uh, Sam Howell is out of town. Man, that guy loved so, Curtis Samuel. I think that my, what is the lesson there? Because my, my is the take, lesson that you can be, you can be fooled. The, my takeaway here is where volume is almost everything for the running back position. Like if for a quarterback, and which translates into your wide receivers, efficiency is a huge part of the, of I the just, formula. I just feel like we're going to be in the pendulum swinging argument making. Right, because then you can then you got a case for everybody, right? We went into this offseason saying we said Washington might throw the ball a ton and be one of the leading and teams we in were passing. Right, they were number one. We we we, we said meant Sam, pass attempts. We so. said Sam Howell might throw it a bunch, and that could be good. He did throw it a bunch. It was not good. So it's like, but then if you're if you focus on a low pass attempt efficiency team, we're like, ah, we need more pass attempts. Just feels like uh, I've heard both arguments a lot in the offseason. Well, and you're going to have you're going to have both arguments here coming into 2024 because it depends on what you believe in Drake May or or uh, Jalen Daniels. If if you think Jaden Jaden Daniels, if you think those guys are great and you think they can truly CJ Stroud, it, it, I mean, I do think like let's say Kirk Cousins came, they they decide to go out and sign Kirk Cousins. Yeah, I think. <laughs> That would be uh, Terry McLaurin would be great. <laughs> that, yeah. that that won't happen. But won't. Yeah. No, 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 it won't. Yeah, yeah. But but my point is, Terry McLaurin would be great if he had Kirk Cousins. So if Drake May is a C.J. Stroud, is a Justin Herbert, um, which I you know I've heard that comp a lot for him. Well, then yeah, it is a value. Now historically speaking, I prefer to bet against wide receivers with rookie quarterbacks. It is very, very rare, Tank Dell and Nico Collins aside, for wide receivers to succeed with rookie quarterbacks, even future good rookie quarterbacks or good quarterbacks in their rookie season. So I'll I'll be betting against um, a massive breakout, huge success. But given where those ADPs are right now, it seems like they're still probably a little under. All the risk is baked in. All right, stat number four for you. Uh, Kyle has titled this one, Time to Wave the White Flag. Speaking of Rashad White, who finished as the RB7 on the season. However, his 3.64 yards per carry is the lowest for a top 15 running back over the last five years. His .7 fantasy points per opportunity was below the league average. And if you look historically, this is where it gets interesting. Um. If you look at the last 14 running backs who finished top 10 but below the league average in fantasy points per attempt, which he was below the league average, here's what happened their next year. So basically, if you had an outlier top performance with low efficiency numbers, what happened the next year? 13 of the 14 dropped in fantasy points per game. The average loss was 3.4 points per game, and only three of them remained in the top 10. That was Nick Chubb. Zeke and Derrick Henry. I don't think we are willing to hand those no, uh, no. that kind of a, a a title to 
Rashad White. And they, they remain in the top, top 10 because those are touchdown scorers. Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry, Zeke, they, those guys were scoring touchdowns in those inefficient years. Now, that is part of why Rashad White was successful this year. He found the end zone a lot, but he does not project to be someone that regularly sees the end zone a ton. He hasn't so far in his career. It was a lot through the air, um, and this isn't you know a, a team projected to really be a uh, one of the top teams in the league. So I think the bet will probably be against Rashad White. He's currently the running back 11 in average draft position. Yeah, Ooh. it's just how much do you care about that efficiency metric and, and what we're saying here. I mean, I feel like what you just said about Tampa Bay was exactly what was said about them heading into the season. Right. Like verbatim. No, I think I was way lower. I I said this year I don't expect them to be a top team. I did expect Tampa Bay to be competing for like a top three pick. I, I genuinely thought they would be one, one of, of the, the worst. worst in the league going into last year. I they were pretty darn they were they were good. They they were not a bad team at all. I think the my takeaway here is is just if if Rashad White gets the exact same opportunity and his team is competent, then Rashad White will be fine. But this is the the warning sign of if, might not be happy if, with that. If any, well, I'm saying if anybody else of value comes into this running back room, and I'm saying like anybody, you could have a huge problem for Rashad White because because if he's if he remains this inefficient, but his opportunities go down, then you're it it will be. Like you really hope that they're trailing and Rashad White gets five receptions that week. Okay, I mean, you talk about a tough player to evaluate. It feels like RB eleven is drafting him near his ceiling, so there's a lot of risk, according to this breakdown, in taking him at his peak. And currently, the depth chart for the Bucks is Rashad White, Sean Tucker, and Patrick Laird. Who so? So they they will be putting someone on here. And the only la last year it was Sean Tucker and Chase Edmonds were like that was the competition. And while I had hopes for Sean Tucker, but what if they, they don't? Just, what if they don't add someone? Yeah. What if they don't? Then, then will you feel like just re-rolling it? I will feel like it it could be worth it, but it's even at RB eleven that still is like you're you're taking on a lot of risk for a player who. So far in his career, is not known to like he can't H hand you uh, into a strong week. He only scored on the ground five weeks. Yeah, right, you have six, so he didn't. Six score, he had six touchdowns. touchdowns. He only scored f in five weeks. He did have a lot of these twenty carry games. Which look, I don't. That's what I mean. Of but like those are games that you're going to have necessarily damaged efficiency a lot of the time. Because they're they're you know they won a lot of games down the stretch, so one you know four straight victories twenty twenty five twenty one twenty. So you know you're salting away games, right? Sure. And I guess I just wonder if when you watched him, was he an impressive player or not? I thought he was a fine player. I thought he was impressive in the passing game, in the receiving game. Okay. Yeah, that he's going to be a tough one next year. Yes, because I will. think most people you know. It was a really good experience to have Rashad White. You got him at a low draft cost, and he was one of the most consistent running backs in all of football. Um, and then next year, it might not be as yeah. Next might year might not be as pretty. You should be looking for the next Rashad White, not the same one, not the one who's now overvalued. All right, number five here. <laughs> Let James Cook. He had fifteen hundred and sixty-seven yards from scrimmage. James Cook, running back for the Bills. This number really blew me away. Third in the league behind CMC and Brees Hall. I was like, what? 1,567 yards from scrimmage. And yet. Did it feel that way to you? Did you? No. Did no. you, like, hearing, no, but that's, hearing that he had more yards from scrimmage behind everyone other than CMC and Brees Hall, I, I just, I, I was like, I got to vet this. <laughs> no, it didn't feel that way. And I, I you know, he, he caught fire at the back half of the year, but I think a lot of people like myself, in the first half of the year, you felt like you understood what he was going to be and what he was capable of being for the Bills, and then you either moved on or lived with that. I moved on. And then the team moved on from their offensive coordinator. 
And then they move directly to James Cook as the engine for the team. And he is one of only five running backs since 2000 to finish in the top 12 with two or fewer rushing touchdowns. So he only had five carries inside the five <laughs> because they were forcing him to Latavius Murray and later um, Leonard five net. <laughs> well, Ty Johnson got involved as well. It, and, of course, Josh Allen. Yeah, that, yeah Josh which Allen will is, not be changing. Josh Allen is the largest threat to James Cook. He, where Kyle, pull up James Cook best ball ADP if you could. He is – it's frustrating because this is – it's like the opposite of Rashad White of this guy is going to be pretty great. So running back 12. So right off the bat, who would you rather have next year at this point, Rashad White or James Cook? Rashad White. With the depth charts staying the same, it would be Rashad White for me. Right. But I'm saying that you, in your mind, making the, which is like, that's what best ball is right now of, I'm going to make some projection bets yeah. of they're going to do this. Like, to me, the Bills, I was going to say, I don't think they'll add anybody splashy, but they keep they keep being in the news tied to big-name players of, like, they're going to try and trade for somebody. Like they, Maybe that's just the media and nothing's actually coming from the team, but I would expect the Tampa Bay backfield to, be get, to get a little bit more shook up. So at this point, I would say James Cook. You know, I, I, I could see both teams being very happy with what they have production-wise from both sure. running backs. I mean, I, I do see that as an outcome, you yeah. know. I think we I think last year there was a lot of – Sean Tucker's name got brought up because we all said, well, they're not going to give everything to White, and then they did. They were like, yeah, we yeah. will. And um, James Cook, they tried not to give everything to James Cook, and they didn't go well. So it, it is interesting to have that dynamic. Now, whether they – you know, whether they trust him around the goal line next year, I wouldn't I wouldn't trust it, but you're also not betting on him on the back of an outlier touchdown season. Yeah. Right? There's just it it's one of those situations where you know he's not gonna be the goal line guy. If he gets five rushing touchdowns, him being James Cook, if he gets five rushing touchdowns, then you know four of them were long. Four of them were, you know, ten, twenty yard rushing touchdowns. They they no matter what we want, no matter how much we say, that's the role they should they should not take that role from him. They've already proven uh that they are not going to have him in that role. They they run packages, they take him out when they get down there, and they're gonna keep doing it. But Aaron but Jones was the number nine running back in football with two touchdowns in twenty twenty two on the ground. Number twelve in football with four touchdowns in twenty twenty one. That's my biggest kind of comp situation there. Well, let me throw this out though. From weeks one through ten, so this is the old busted offense. Ten points a game, almost fifteen opportunities uh, per game, and a targets per route run of thirteen point nine percent. Weeks eleven to eighteen, fifteen points a game, twenty opportunities a game, and the targets per route run jumped up to twenty two point six. So I can't necessarily offer you more rushing touchdown, but what if I <laughs> offer you? You making more, a sales deal? Uh, what if I offer you more re guaranteed receptions for James Cook? And if you give James Cook a bunch of receptions, good things are gonna happen. Yeah, if, is that have I have I changed your mind? No, because that's already what I was expecting. I the, these these All guys right. are are fairly comped. The efficiency is more with James Cook, but the the total receiving numbers will still be on Rashad White's side. James Cook from that week eleven on would have been on pace for forty eight receptions. That's a good number. But that's not like a that's not one of those PPR machines that are going to flat out win for fantasy. Yeah, and they're they're you know, I've seen the Bills mocked to select one of the top tier wide receivers in the draft. They should. Um if Diggs is back and they have one of those guys, uh, you know, I would imagine his target per route run is somewhere in between the first half and the second half of the year next year. That's fine. Would, we'll, Which would be high. We'll take more than 13.9. But Dalton Kincaid's involvement, I'm just, I, I don't well, know. Well, Gabe, uh, Gabe the Babe will probably not be there. Right, that's why I said, oh, Dal they gotta that's why I said Dalton Kincaid. <laughs> they got to resign him. Um, I just, I this team showed me that they can flip their identity on offense in a moment's notice. So, you know, I think they could do it again. 
they could become that pass first team and, and it would be interesting. All right, quick break back with another big stat. Better be big. Uh, all right. Uh, this is such such a big stat, Mike. Um, well, this will be a good discussion. Kyle Pitts is the discussion that we're going to have. Oh, Last year, despite playing only 10 games, Mark Andrews still outscored Kyle Pitts by 2.1 fantasy points. Yeah. Um, He's good. Somehow, Kyle Pitts led all tight ends in air yards last year. That seems... Shocking to me. Uh, he had the highest average depth of target, and yet his most yards gained on a single play was 39 yards. Whereas Johnu Smith, his own teammate, had multiple 50-plus <laughs> yard plays. Uh, it did come out that Kyle Pitt's knee surgery was more complex than people had originally estimated. I'm so thankful to hear that, not because he had to go through a more complex surgery, but because there's a reason he didn't look yeah, he watching him. almost robotic mm -hmm. at times. Like he didn't know how to pivot properly. And so this is a very, very young player on a team where the majority of targets, like the highest percentage in the league, went to tight end last year. It didn't work out for Kyle Pitts. We're having the same discussion every single offseason. So is there hope entering year four? I have my thoughts, but I want to hear from you guys. There's definitely hope. Um, because he's 23 years old, there's an offensive coordinator change, and Johnu Smith had you know the the big long plays, but they weren't air yard plays. I'm sick of seeing Kyle Pitts pretty much used exclusively 20 yards down the field. Where's just the regular tight end plays that all these you know you when you watch David Njoku just get right just you're just running right across the field, you know three yards in front of the line of scrimmage, just run across. That's where you need to get a talented athlete like Kyle Pitts involved. And the fact that they're – like if Arthur Smith was here this year, there's things I would like. I'd still like the running game. I'd still be in on Bijan, but I'd be 100% out on Kyle Pitts. His utilization isn't right. I think that even with a bad quarterback, which I project they will have, uh, even with a bad quarterback, if the way they use Kyle Pitts changes, he can be valuable. So I am um, – if you watched him last year, oh yeah, that, that was, was part of tuba. That was part of the struggle. The, I don't think those underneath routes were going to work because he couldn't get in and out of breaks without falling down sometimes. So getting him the ball in that intermediate space, maybe he's more healthy this year. So where where do you land on? I your land belief? on uh, plenty of hope. Yes, I mean we're coming off a year where we're heralding David Njoku in year seven and Evan Ingram in year seven, like young athletic tight ends, assuming he is healthy and able to get back to full health, he has elite skills at the position that a lot of guys don't possess. And I think we can have more confidence in you know Raheem Morris and Zach Robinson on the offensive side of the football to hopefully use their weapons. You know, they a lot was being made of the fact that Raheem Morris instantly named, you know Drake London. Drake London and Bijan. Like I've seen some follow up discussions, including ones with Bijan and and them just talking about Kyle Pitts' utilization and, and the weapon, the special talent that he is. So hope, yeah, I'm not giving up hope. He's the tight end eleven right now in best ball. But again, remember, and I want to say this a couple times this offseason. We name we mentioned the best ball draft positioning because they're happening right now. Right. There's a lot of those going on. It is our best estimate of how people are valuing players. But there's also some variation in best ball compared to redraft leagues in the sense that, you know, when you're you're in the middle of a best ball draft right now, Jason, when you take best ball players, you're also valuing some components that are different. Oh, for sure. Like upside. Like if Kyle Pitts, if you if you outlaid all the tight ends in football on a on a piece of paper with their lowest possible and highest possible seasons. You're drafting according to some of those highest possibles. You want your, yourself to have a chance at getting a top 10 tight end, or I'm sorry, a top five tight end from the tight end 11 yeah, spot. Yeah, and, and it's not even exclusive to how they finish the season, but can, how big of weeks individually can they put up? Who has the ability at tight end to put up 100 yards, have a 70-yard touchdown, it, despite, you know, obviously this last year that not 
seeming like Kyle Pitts's cup of tea. He certainly has that in the cards um, from what he was drafted to be. So, yeah, best ball ADP is different. I do think next year, if he stays around there, if he stays around the last tight end drafted in your league, why not? I I'll probably yeah. be I'll I'll be grabbing two tight ends, which I don't ever do. But if I can grab John U and Kyle, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if I can grab Pitts as my second tight end at the very end of a draft, why not? S see if see if they'll use him right, and if he has that breakout, and if not, cut bait and move on. Yeah, the, uh, Zach Robinson did come out their new offensive coordinator and talk about Pitts and Bijan specifically having formational versatility, being able to move them around. Play the, both go, both of those guys can be slot receivers for you. Yeah, uh, based on the formation. So, um, no hope is not gone. But we were, a lot of the debate around Kyle Pitts is centered around you know projecting him to be a breakout in years past. And I had a year I believed, and I had a year I, w I was more out than anybody last year. So somewhere in the middle, yeah. Don't give up hope quite yet. He's he's too young. If he looks the same next year, I'll be worried. That's fair, because we didn't know a lot about what was going on. We just we just watched it and we were like, eh. yeah. Uh, hopefully I mean, they, uh, with with a new coaching staff, and being a young unsuccessful team, I would imagine you will see Kyle Pitts in preseason, and that will be you know he doesn't have to be involved for you to see how he's running a route and watch a couple plays and say does he look like he used to look or does he look like he looked last year. And it's easy to blame Arthur Smith for everything that's ever gone wrong, ever. It's yeah. so easy. It's, it's pretty it's fun. Not only is it easy, it feels good. Yeah. But the truth is. Not listening. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, is that no matter who your head coach is, if you are a dominant tight end, you're not losing the amount of snaps and opportunities to Jonu Smith that Kyle Pitts lost last year. So you want Pitts to take some of the blame. I think that he wasn't the Bruce. He wasn't the player that he could have been. No. Okay. Regardless of Arthur Smith. All right. Let's jump into the mailbag. 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 Yeah. All right. Our first question here. By the way, you can submit your question on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, or dial our voicemail hotline three zero two four six four TFFB. First question coming in says: Full PPR redraft league. Would taking CD number one overall be crazy? Cra yes. Crazy, no. Rea no. Overreactionary, probably. Do, why is do it? You believe, why do you think it's crazy? Well, uh, do you think that what happened down the stretch, the second half of the year, is the new normal for the Cowboys? I think that when Cooper Cup had a season most comparable to C.D. Lamb's, he went number one the next year for many people. That's fair, but right now, you know, C.D. Lamb is not – when I've seen – when I've been in drafts, um, you know, I, I'm still seeing C.D. Lamb go like third at wide receiver. Uh, but we projected and, – and, Mike, you predicted and talked about your second-half sleeper being Dak Prescott in the middle of the year because – of how bad the matchups the rest of the season were for running backs and how good they were for wide receivers and quarterbacks. And obviously that happened, and it and maybe that just created it to be the new normal. But I, I think that was like panical peak. I don't think you're going to have a season of that level of fire that they were on what is, is, the, is 2024. I still think he's going to be outstanding, great, a number one, a top five wide receiver, but he's in the conversation where I wouldn't take him as the first wide receiver, and I'm and I'm not taking any wide receiver over Christian McCaffrey. Would it be a somewhat shocking revelation to tell you that his run was really from week six on? From week six yeah, on, it, it 200, started right two hundred six targets, two thousand yards, sixteen touchdown pace. So first five weeks were not special, but. That's a good run. That's a 12-game yeah. run. Yeah. The case for going with CD is buying into the, the evolution of the wide receiver. Maybe he took the, the next step because, it's like, Justin Jefferson, he he could have a huge quarterback problem or he could have an old quarterback returning from an Achilles injury and you're hoping that it's not actually a problem and you hope Kirk Cousins is good to go. They re-signed Kirk Cousins. Which one are you drafting? Well, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Just between those two. 
it's Justin Jefferson. Okay. Yeah, well, I, w- uh, I would too. But, I, crazy. But I'm not. But I'm saying I debate. don't think it's wrong. And then Jamar Chase for the how incredible the ceiling games Jamar Chase can have. Jamar Chase has way more games than than Jefferson, where he just vanishes from uh, from the scheme. The Cowboys said we're doing it all exactly the same again. Yeah, maybe cra- that part crazy I like. Is, that crazy part is I the like. wrong word. If, and and if you are super confident, if you're out there listening to Mike talk and being like, "Yeah, see, there's questions here. There's questions there." You know, is 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 Burrow really what he was a couple of years ago after this injury? Is right. Uh, who's the quarterback? You know, Christian McCaffrey's been even, injured. I didn't two bring or three up Tyreek. Who of like of these guys? Tyreek Hill may have the fewest actual questions. Yeah, yeah. besides. Him being what? Older. I mean, he's 30 or 31. Just Tyreek, trying, just Tyreek trying to, a freak of nature. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we would all probably go Jefferson and Tyreek ahead of Lamb. I would. I, did, I think so, yeah. All right, Scott in Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, bonjour. That's a, is that a real bonjour? That might be a hello. Oh, you know what I mean? I don't mean? know, yeah. Although that's, Edmonton, that's not in... Uh, it's in Alberta. It's not, is that French country? <laughs> I don't know. Quebec's French, right? It, it's, it's all French. It's Canada. No, it's not all French. <laughs> Don't say that to our... English is the official language of the province. Well, then bonjour. According to Kyle. So it is bonjour. Yes. yes. Okay. Any Quebecians out there, you'll get a hello. What is your suggestion on dealing with people in Dynasty and Keeper Leagues that refuse to even entertain a trade until the NFL rookie draft? Do I just move on from trying to trade with them or continue to send them offers that I might be overpaying in order to entice them to trade. I, you're not gonna. You're I not think gonna you move them. on. Yeah, you, you. If if they won't even consider trying to trade, then don't try to trade with them. Yeah, man. Don't because they're not gonna consider it. Don't fight with a brick wall. This feels like they just want the sense of satisfaction of pulling one off with yeah, one of these teams. Yeah. But then they're gonna overpay for it. Some people just need a breath, man. Yeah. And I noticed that and in our fun. leagues. Our leagues, we you need a breath. It's and, perfectly fine. Yeah, and some some people absolutely have a, a, a stance of I am going to wait until I know where these players are going before I value any pick. And so if that's their stance, just do the same. Yes, because some people are, are more afraid of the embarrassment of failing at that trade now with the mystery. Yeah. They want to know more, which I don't blame, especially it sounds like you're a guy who's probably gotten a few done in this league. And uh, it might have gone to your side. And then people become more gun shy. All right, Robert, Rich, in Denver, why do you guys hate Jerome Ford? <laughs> He's steady, what? not sexy. He was a top 24 running back 11 times. Um, I would imagine one of the views of hating Jerome Ford is that we didn't bring him up at all in our running back truth episodes, right? We didn't talk about him. We glossed over him because of, because of Nick Chubb, I think. Yeah, yeah. We, there was a Ford glossing that happened. So I... Look, I don't think I hate him. No, he was he was good. He was but fine. like, if I'm writing right. home to mom, I'm not. He doesn't come up. No, there's nothing that like. He like was, why do you love him so much? He huh? was very very serviceable. He liked he liked steady. He was very serviceable. He was important for fantasy. Um, he he had, he had stepped, a stretch. He was he was giving you ten points a week. Yeah, part he of stepped it up during the injury. That's very usable. I'm so proud of him. Yeah. Um. But he's he's got an expiration date. Yeah, I mean he's the backup. And and maybe Nick Chubb, like, yeah, I mean, there our guys are bringing up that Nick Chubb could be a cut t- candidate. No, they're not going to cut him. I don't believe they're going to cut him. I don't. I mean, if they did, then yeah, let's talk about Ford. Sure. As the starter next year, but but I think you know, even if Chubb is still off the injury, is it four or five weeks of steady that you get? Maybe if you're lucky. And they were giving goal line away? Right. I mean, I'll give you the context. So uh, he would be a dead cap hit of only $4 million. Set they, to earn 15.8 would save $11.8 million if they were to cut him. They're not cutting him. I don't think they're cutting him. I think he's there. He's the Larry Fitzgerald of that. They'll overpay Nick Chubb to keep him I, And if they cut him, the reason they would have to cut him is because of Baltimore. That's true. And I don't think they want... I thought you said Baltimore. <laughs> but you said Voldemort. Voldemort is yeah. because of Deshaun I... Watson and the money they gave him. If they say, hey, 
uh, hero of this city, the Nick Voldemort Chubb. Ravens. <laughs> Nick Chubb, you are out. I know you had a bad injury, and we're going to just do you dirty and cut you. Uh, it's because of Voldemort. I just don't think they can. That's I, bad. It's a massive PR hit. But, he okay, so third, he is the third highest running back cap hit of 2024. Then they'll restructure. He, they, they could go the restructure route, but he's going to be – Playing a, playing at the age of 29, Kyle, do I have that right? Coming off that injury, I genuinely hope, because the, Nick Chubb is awesome, I hope it doesn't happen, but for how cold the, the NFL business is, it would not surprise me in the least. I, look, I don't think they care about what his cap hit is relative to other running backs. It's just whether it fits with that team. Well, and nobody just, works harder than Nick Chubb to get back from injury. I'm betting on Chubb. Yeah. It, it, Again, I hope you are right, but his cap hit is almost sixteen million dollars. I'd pay him seventeen. <laughs> I mean, this conclusive <laughs> breaking news. All right, I everyone What's needs to know this. Al Borland just watched finally for the first time in his life. He just watched the first two Harry Potter movies. Oh, oh right. well, welcome, nerd! I know who Voldemort is now. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, so uh, when so did now those, you get name. When did those come out? By the way. I have can no we idea. get can we the get a release one? date for the first one? The first one's got to be what like. I think I was working in a movie theater when they came out. Yeah, looks no, like two thousand one. What? So twenty three years. Man. Oh man! Congratulations. What happened to time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I was a young man. <laughs> well, how, how old did you think they were? I th ten I, years? No, I I no, I thought it was like I thought it was in high school in mm. the mid. You know, just yeah. It was so it, it was so long was ago. <laughs> it had to be in the nineteen hundreds. <laughs> Wait a minute. I know it was a long time ago. You're telling me a long time ago was 2001? So anyway, he had 23 years to read the books, and he didn't do it. I don't know how Jason made it through the second one. I'm not there is a afraid lot of, spiders. of fake-looking spiders. Like I, I, I am very, 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 very afraid of spiders. But bad CGI spiders, they don't you're, even you're, bother me. They don't bother you. Hmm. Well, good, congrats. Good CGI Thank spiders. You. They can give me. <laughs> uh, have you seen uh, Lord of the Rings? None of those yet. Okay. Well, we'll catch him up. <laughs> All right. That is going to do it for today's episode of the show. Thank you for joining us. Brooksy, what do we got going on on Thursday? We'll be answering more questions, and uh, okay. we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm losing you. I'm <laughs> losing you. I can't hear the question. <laughs> All right. We're still figuring Thursday out, everybody. <laughs> Well, I'll talk to you then. Thank you for joining us. And check out the Dynasty Show. It releases tomorrow. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Have a safe one. Goodbye. <laughs>For listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.